As ultralight pilots in the United States, we enjoy a lot of freedom. Fly as low as you want, as high as you're brave enough, with no license, age limit, or medical check required. In my opinion, this is such a beautiful thing, and it really highlights the privilege that we have as American citizens. However, with this freedom comes the necessity to protect it. This looks like each of us doing our own part to self-govern and follow the very short list of rules provided by the FAA. If you are just discovering my channel here, I am a paramotor pilot as well as a USPPA rated instructor in the sport, and I'm dedicated to providing quality educational content here on YouTube. My consistent aim has always been and will always be to raise the bar of confidence, skill, and safety of the pilots in this sport. And my goal with this video is to provide a digestible breakdown of the 13 rules to FAR 103 and the reasoning behind each of them. So grab a snack and a notepad, be ready to hit pause on this video if you need to, and I'd encourage you to head on over to USPPA's website. I've linked it in the description below. Find the FAR 103 page and follow along. To provide a brief overview, FAR 103 is the shortest part in a Bible-thick list of rules that all aviators of all categories abide by in the US of A. In our tiny slice, taking up little more than a page, ultralight aircraft have been put in a category of very very low regulation. Seeing our relatively low threat to anybody based on our lack of speed, weight, and brains, the FAA basically said they've got bigger fish to fry. Hello, this is Jim with the FAA. Wait, slow, slow, slow down. They're they flying a what now? The rules in part 103 exist to ensure that we do not endanger others. And unknowingly doing so can lead to greater regulations in our sport. A great example for us to heed is the FAA's response to the explosion in consumer drones. With so many people flying them and many in pretty dumb ways, the FAA's hand was sort of forced to shorten the leash on UAVs. Anyone that's been in the hobby of RC aircraft can tell you it's been a real headache to have to register their foam airplane that weighs less than a paperweight. So at the risk of sounding like your mother, behave yourself and set a good example for your wingman. Otherwise, before you know it, you're gonna be finding yourself waiting to fly because your scheduled inspection with the FAA is still two months out. So with that, if you are ready to jump into the meat and potatoes of FAR 103, hit that like button for me and subscribe to this channel if this content is your cup of tea. And then let's go ahead and jump right into subpart A here with the general overview covering applicability, specification, certification, and registration, or really lack thereof. 103.1, applicability. This first section is used to define what an ultralight vehicle is, how it's used, and the specs it needs to remain within. A, is used or intended to be used for manned operation in the air by a single occupant. And I'll talk about tandems here in just a minute. B, is used or intended to be used for recreation or sport purposes only. And while this sounds like a non-role, like of course I'm gonna have fun flying my butt fan, it is what this is excluding that is more important to note. Namely the fact that you are not allowed to be paid to fly. There is a decent amount of fudgeability with this rule, but to clarify, when I charge someone for a tandem ride, I'm really charging them for the educational experience. The waiver given to me by the FAA administrator clearly says that both the pilot and the passenger need to understand that I am being monetized for the educational experience prior, during, and after the actual flight. Moving on to C here, does not have any US or foreign airworthiness certificate. What this is really saying is that in order for our aircraft to be considered an ultralight operating under part 103, it cannot be registered anywhere else in the world with an airworthiness certificate and still operate in the US under part 103. If your ultralight is certified with an airworthiness certificate, you now operate under a separate set of rules, and I believe this is experimental aircraft or maybe sport pilot related. I'm not really sure, I'm a little bit unfamiliar. If you have more knowledge on this, help me educate in the comment section below. I would really appreciate the knowledge. Continuing on with the physical specs to be considered an ultralight, D, if unpowered, weighs less than 155 pounds, or if powered, weighs less than 254 pounds empty weight, excluding floats and safety devices, which are intended for deployment in a potentially catastrophic situation. 
two, has a fuel capacity not exceeding five US gallons. Three, is not capable of more than 55 knots calibrated airspeed at full power in level flight. For you paramotor pilots out there, this means with your trims set to neutral, no speed bar applied, and actually at cruise power rather than full power, since you are slightly faster at that cruise power setting. And four has a power off stall speed, which does not exceed 24 knots. So all four of these last points relating to powered ultralights pertain to keeping a low threat profile. It's pretty tough to do any significant damage to property or threaten national security when you weigh less than a sofa going 25 miles per hour. 103.5, waivers. No person may conduct operations that require a deviation from this part except under a written waiver issued by the administrator. So tandems, night flights, stadium fly-ins, altitude records above 18,000 feet, or other controlled airspace infringements all require waivers from the FAA. And unless you've got a pretty good reason and an in on the FAA, with the exception of a tandem waiver, you're not likely going to have much success. 103.7, certification and registration. A. Notwithstanding any other section pertaining to certification of aircraft or their parts or equipment, ultralight vehicles and their component parts and equipment are not required to meet the airworthiness certification standards specified for aircraft or to have certificates of airworthiness. So in 103.1, it mentioned the fact that you cannot have an airworthiness certificate in a different country and operate under part 103 here in the United States. And this point is just saying that we do not need to acquire that in the United States either. We do not need any paperwork saying that our equipment is safe to fly. And in addition that no annual inspection is needed. B, notwithstanding any other section pertaining to airman certification, Operators of ultralight vehicles are not required to meet any aeronautical knowledge, age, or experience requirements to operate those vehicles or to have airmen or medical certificates. And this right here is what makes paramotors so darn attractive. There are practically no limits as to who can fly them, which is just awesome. And unfortunately, this will likely be the first thing that gets amended from part 103 if we do not do our part to help educate the newer or prospective ultralightist. C. Notwithstanding any other section pertaining to registration and marking of aircraft, ultralight vehicles are not required to be registered or to bear markings of any type. So this basically means that there is no need for a tail number that is used to identify the pilot of the aircraft, the aircraft's history, and for tracking purposes. So we're now going to move on to the second part of FAR 103, which covers the where, when, and how. Before continuing on, I do owe these awesome people right here a shout out for supporting me monetarily over on Patreon. The link is in the description below. With this being my full-time job, aside from my nine-month-old, and with the world of educational paramotor content being as niche as it is, the support I receive over there is like mana. So moving on now to subpart B with the operating rules, 103.9 covers hazardous operations. A. No person may operate any ultralight vehicle in a manner that creates a hazard to other persons or property. B. No person may allow an object to be dropped from an ultralight vehicle if such action creates a hazard to other persons or property. And here is the crux of part 103. You can be as dumb and reckless as you want, as long as it doesn't put anybody else or their property at risk. I would say this rule is the most commonly broken or put into question based on the level of gray area here. Tucker got dropping a roll of toilet paper from a thousand feet is pretty tough to deem hazardous, despite the haters' best efforts there. But let's say that you're flying along and unbeknownst to you, there are equestrians that you are about to come upon. The horses spook, they buck off the riders, injuring person and damaging property. If this type of situation were to be taken to court, I would presume they would find you guilty, regardless of your intention or awareness of the riders. It's important to understand, the law is always going to side with the ground dwellers, period, end of story. So it is therefore the public's perspective of you that really needs to be in the forefront of our minds. So to this point, I recommend that as you're flying along, just assume that people are not pleased to see you. I have definitely made some questionable judgment calls flying around the public with an air of showing off 
only to get a load of this. We are loud, intrusive UFOs that give people anxiety. So it is really best to just keep your distance. 103.11, daylight operations. A, no person may operate an ultralight vehicle except between the hours of sunrise and sunset. B, notwithstanding paragraph A of this section, Ultralight vehicles may be operated during the twilight periods 30 minutes before official sunrise and 30 minutes after official sunset, or in Alaska, during the period of civil twilight as defined in the Air Almanac. If, one, the vehicle is equipped with an operating anti-collision light, a strobe, visible for at least three statute miles, and two, all operations are conducted in uncontrolled airspace. So this is another rule that I've observed, unfortunately, to be commonly broken, with pilots getting in the air a little bit earlier than that legal limit, and then landing a little bit later than that legal limit. Is this a huge deal? Probably not, but again, the more people that do break these rules, it's only gonna lead to further regulations in the future. To point number two on this list, all operations are conducted in uncontrolled airspace. This means G airspace. Some people believe E is also uncontrolled, but that is not true. So G airspace starts from the ground and goes up to 1200 feet outside of the vicinity of any airport. Whereas within the vicinity of an airport, that ceiling comes down to 700 feet. So if you are flying at your local municipal airport and you're flying above 700 feet, technically you're breaking this rule. And to clarify, the ceiling differences here happen at this faded magenta line that I'm pointing out here. 103.13 operation near aircraft and right-of-way rules. A, each person operating an ultralight vehicle shall maintain vigilance so as to see and avoid aircraft and shall yield the right-of-way to all aircraft. I know this sounds like another no-brainer, but I have personally found myself getting complacent in this department. When you are flying any aircraft, you have two number one responsibilities. The first being where you're gonna land in an emergency, and the second being to locate all of the other aircraft sharing the air with you. The strategy that I've learned to adopt is to always assume something is flying at you. You're way more likely to locate the flying threats around you if you're slightly paranoid about it. B, no person may operate an ultralight vehicle in a manner that creates a collision hazard with respect to any aircraft. Fairly recently, there was a collision between a paramotor and a Cessna caravan that tragically ended with both pilots passing away. The paramotor pilot was flying along the glide slope that the caravan was on approaching the runway. Not only was the pilot not vigilant enough to see and avoid, but they were also flying in a way that posed a very real hazard to other aircraft. So untowered airports are generally very convenient landing zones for ultralights, being smooth, flat plots of land with a refreshing absence of power lines. But flying from them requires the need for extra caution and awareness of that flying sheet metal that is frequently coming and going. C. Powered ultralights shall yield the right of way to unpowered ultralights. This means as paramotor pilots specifically, we are the bottom of the food chain. Any near miss or collision is automatically our fault. 103.15, operations over congested areas. No person may operate an ultralight vehicle over any congested area of a city, town, or settlement or over any open air assembly of persons. The FAA loosely defines a congested area as two or more people, but common sense should fill in the gaps here. If you see horses, boats, a busy parking lot, or even a lone pair of hikers, it's wise to just stay far away. 103.17, operations in certain airspace. No person may operate an ultralight vehicle within class A, B, C, or D airspace, or within the lateral boundaries of the surface area of class E airspace designated for an airport, unless that person has prior authorization from the air traffic control facility having jurisdiction over that airspace. Whew, let's break that down a little bit. I'm gonna do a separate video focused purely on airspace and VFR charts, so stay tuned for that where I'm gonna go in depth on all of this stuff. But in short, if there is an airport nearby, 
that has a control tower, you need to be at least five miles away from it. So some airports have an extension to their surface controlled airspace that is class E indicated in dash magenta as I'm showing you here. And it is not legal to fly through this without prior authorization. This is a bit of a special rule because we can legally fly through E airspace that is above G airspace, but when it's a surface E, we cannot fly through it. Often this surface E will have effective hours to it, but I think it wise to just stay away from it regardless. 103.19, operations in prohibited or restricted areas. No person may operate an ultralight vehicle in prohibited or restricted areas unless that person has permission from the using or controlling agency as appropriate. So just think big military complexes, the White House, nuclear facilities, and so on and so forth. 103.20, flight restrictions in the proximity of certain areas designated by notice to airmen, NOTAMs. No person may operate an ultralight vehicle in areas designated in a NOTAM unless permission has been given by air traffic control or a flight standards certificate of waiver or authorization issued for the demonstration or event. So with these TFRs, think football games, Disney World, rocket launches, forest fires, or presidential visits. TFRs can pop up suddenly, so it's always a good idea to check your airspace prior to heading out to your field. A great resource to get information on local TFRs is the FAA's website. I've linked the TFR resource page that updates real time in the description below. It's just a good idea to keep in mind that any infringements on restricted, prohibited, or TFR airspace can cause a visit from an F-16, and those things don't share the air well with paramotors. 103.21 visual reference with the surface. No person may operate an ultralight vehicle except by visual reference with the surface. While clouds are awesome to see from above, it is illegal to lose sight of the ground. I believe the reasoning behind this is because we are prohibited to fly through clouds. And with how often ultralights suffer engine outs, it's now unavoidable to fly through those clouds. So if you're gonna be above the clouds, you need to find the hole that you're gonna be able to fly through should your engine quit. 103.23. Flight visibility and cloud clearance requirements. No person may operate an ultralight vehicle when the flight visibility or distance from clouds is less than that in the table found below. Simplifying all of this a little bit, in class G airspace, clouds can be flown around at any distance as long as you do not go in them and you are maintaining a mile of visibility. While clouds and visibility in class E airspace require a greater berth. In class E, we have to remain 500 feet below, 2,000 feet horizontally, and 1,000 feet above clouds and maintain three miles of visibility within this airspace. The reason being is that airplanes with pilots that are instrument flight rated are flying through this area. They do not need to adhere to these visibility requirements. These distance minimums are meant to give you and the IFR aircraft time to see and avoid each other when the Gulf Stream comes punching through that cloud. All operations in class A, B, C, and D airspace or class E airspace designated for an airport must receive prior air traffic control authorization as required in 103.17 of this part. To reiterate, any controlled airspace that is not class E above G requires permission from air traffic control to enter. And there we have it, the 13 rules that you've got to abide by as an ultralight in the United States of America. They're pretty simple, to the point, and pretty hard to misconstrue unless you're trying. With any level of uncommon sense, most of these rules do not need mentioning. But if we are to maintain the freedoms that we've been gifted by the FAA, it is worth an occasional revisit of where our boundaries lie. The FAA expects, as ultralight pilots, that we self-govern our sport. And my hope is that this video serves this very purpose and that it clarifies any fogginess that you may have had on part 103. So do our sport a favor and share this video with someone who might benefit from this information and help make ultra lighting smarter and safer. 
If you have any questions whatsoever left unanswered, please leave them in the comments section below. I get to all of the comments and I love connecting with you guys there. This is gonna do it for today's video. If you found this one valuable, you're definitely going to appreciate this one on the unwritten rules to fly by. As always, thank you for watching. This is Lifted PPG. My name is Micah Stevens. Don't forget to take that deep breath and we'll see you guys in the next video. Cheers. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.